So justifying prices, you don't justify prices through words. You justify prices through results. So you can go there, you can talk to your black and blue, but ultimately it's a visual result that someone's looking for. And so the only way to really justify a high price is to have done work that is excellent and to showcase that social media, website, things like that. The actions were speaking. If you were exactly the same as the other guy and then they go, you're 75, they're 55, it doesn't matter what you say. The words are not going to do anything, especially with the actions, you've done everything and then you have some great before and after photos. That's the way that I would justify prices and out of 268 calls we made one year, we only had six ratings that were six or less out of 10 and we were charging about $127 per hour per person. So thank you very much today for joining me, Luke. We've got a very special guest and people might be going, it's not a franchisee and you're our very first non-franchisee guest on our Jim's Oh, really? Pod- yes, on the Jim's Mind podcast. We normally interview franchisees and franchisors, so you're our very first non-Jim's guest, which is great to have someone from outside our business to talk about everything you're doing. You've got one of the biggest podcasts in Australia for the lawn mowing and the gardening industry, which is fantastic. And you've had a couple of really good great episodes that our guys have listened to, which they would have listened to based on all the views and downloads they've got, which was the pricing one and the recent survey one, which you've done, which was quite popular as well. And I listened to that, those findings, and I was we were actually quite surprised. Jim actually updated his Jim's Ethos talk based on what you sent through. So we actually had the training week the next day. And he's, he normally quotes $60 an hour, and he updated that based on what you sent through to him. So thank you very much for that. So he was very quite surprised about um, the figures from that report as well, which was quite good to see. But yeah, what I want to do, Luke, all about you, mate. So our franchisees and franchisors will listen to your podcast. They probably recognize your face, recognize your voice, and get a lot of out of what you do. So first of all, thank you for doing that for, for the boys and for the industry. I know a lot of our Jim's mind guys will be a fan of yours and appreciate it. But what I want to just first talk quickly first about, about yourself. You've been an independent for more than 10 years. Do you want to give a quick summary of your journey uh, for those who don't know you and how you got into doing the podcasting thing, first of all, and obviously your, a bit of a synopsis of your business journey? Well, thanks for having me on. And I'm actually, it is an honor to be the first non gyms person. So <laughs> I'm going to take this opportunity to slag gyms. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, we don't edit them. So we don't edit them. So you can say whatever you want. It's no problem. No, well, I put something on, on uh, LinkedIn. You, you saw that when, we, when I posted your podcast that I think the gyms versus independent battle is, is useless. It's fighting people <laughs> who are on the same team. I believe that a good contractor... And a, a good independent and a good gyms are on the same team because they're yeah. trying to lift the standard of the industry anyways. So <laughs> I love I, I love everybody who's doing a good job. My story is I started gardening when I was 15. I got lucky in that uh, when I was turned 18, and this is paid gardening, just, just you know, part-time stuff as you do when you're 15. But I got lucky when I was 18 that a friend's dad was a groundskeeper at a school. He recommended me to be employed by that school. I looked older than when I was. I just left school. They hired me not knowing my age. Regretted that three months later when I had to give them some tax documents. They realized I was older than some of the students. So younger than some of the students have been kept back a year. Then I got an opportunity after a while to be the head groundskeeper at that school. Raised, uh, you know, got up to that position before I was 20 and then realized this isn't paying much. I love gardening. So I started my own business not long before my 20th birthday, but I was just doing it part-time on the side. And then by the time I was 21, I had a full-time employee. And that's where I made, you know, this is, this is not the story that says I've, I'm a genius. I made so many mistakes and I lost money and I tried doing this. I tried hiring people. I made for years and years and years, I made heaps of mistakes learned from those mistakes. And for a long time, I wished I had resources on the internet that could have taught me that what I was doing, whilst optimistic and as educated as I possibly could be, the the American stuff wasn't as helpful. Mm. And I made so many mistakes. I lost a lot of money. I did good things, bad things. You know, I, I've been up and down like everybody has. And that's as it, essentially nine years after that, I was like, still don't see a podcast that's quite doing the content I want. So I started my own. That's kind of a very short synopsis of of what it is. But my story is I I try not to come across, like if you want to do the sexy numbers and all that sort of stuff, the business, we've served close to 5,000 individual locations. We've at one point had about 13 employees. We've done contracts that are six figures. And I started with a $6,000 tax return. But no. the, tr- the true story of the business is I've made 
every mistake under the book and I've almost lost it all and I've really tried my best and I want to make myself jealous of my own listeners that I wish I had my own podcast 10 years ago, if that makes yeah. sense. So I don't try and come across as like, I'm an expert because, oh, well, you know, depends how you define by expert. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to, I'm not someone who's succeeded in everything. And when I, when I interviewed Jim as well, I get that same feel from Jim. You know, even though he's incredibly successful, he, you know, he talks about his mistakes. And no, you're right. I think, I think mistakes, you know, obviously we try and we want our franchises not to make mistakes, but I think obviously sometimes it's the best teacher. And as Jim says, Jim, Jim says he makes mistakes all the time, which he does. He'll make them, he made them even today at work. We had the power out at work and he cheaped out on some battery, solar batteries that didn't work because he went for the cheaper option. If he went for the proper option, it would have been power today. So Jim, Jim made a mistake today. So he was quite unhappy with that. So he makes them all the time. But um, I was going to say with well, then with what you're you're doing through your journey, you had you, you had all the American was it only the American YouTube resources you had to sort of go off, and it was just pretty much flying mm-hmm. by yourself. Or how did you did you talk to other people in the industry? Did you know anyone else in the industry? How did you sort of guide yourself? Because to be in business for ten years, there's only a small percentage you make it to that mark. So how did you how did you storm those sort of weathers, and how did you get get through those mistakes? The first thing is that there there wasn't Australian stuff at all. I started my business before even Ben Sims had lawn tips or any of those YouTube advice things. You know, he started that in 2017. I started my business in 2013. So I, yes, I made a, at the beginning, it was a lot of YouTube. You know, there'd be some American guys, but their business advice, I think perhaps 40% crosses over, but there's a 60% gap in terms of the weather and the, and the client's expectation, the machines, the type of property, how grass even grows. You know, they're dealing with tall fescues and, and all that sort of stuff. And they've never heard the word Kaikuyu before. It's So I got some good stuff, but then, you know, pricing wise was wrong. And so, yes, it was a lot of fumbling and stumbling. I'm blessed in a sense that my granddad uh, was an accountant. And so early days, I'd have a lot of chats with my granddad trying to work things out. I got great business advice in that sense, but I also was an idiot in that I was... Uh, and I still am very ambitious, very optimistic, uh, which has pluses, but also I get very excited about ideas that are good ideas. Executing them is a different story sometimes. So some of the mistakes I've made have been too keen, too excited, too energetic, something that is not the worst idea you've ever heard, but a bit risky, that kind of stuff. Well, I was going to say, what's the what's the current size of your business staff wise? You mentioned thirteen, which is probably the biggest business I've heard. I've heard of we've got franchisees of interview who've got eight, nine staff, maybe max, but it never it seems to be always. From what I know, might, there might be franchisees who have more that I just don't know about them. But that seems to be a cap of the eight to nine mm. person business. You got to thirteen. Once you get past that number of ten, what were the problems? Was it the same problems that just come up? There's just more of them, or how did you get past that ten number? Because I think a lot of our people don't get. They, might, they want to build to maybe a 10 or 20 person business, but there's always that stop from what I can tell. So what what is that stop and, and, and how did you get past it? Here is the biggest problem that's happening in the industry, right? There's three things happening that stop people from get, getting past that, right? The first is that on the one hand, gardening is seen as such a simple job. Yeah. So there's a price expectation from the market. They expect a certain price. On the other hand, it's actually a very difficult job. Things like, like you talk about the rain that you guys had over East, the heat we've had. I don't know if you guys are fully aware in Perth, all the Perth contractors listening to this. We've, we've had, I think, five days in the last maybe 11, 12 that are over 40 and probably four, three that are high 30s. To It's 7, 17 right now. It's 31 degrees, right? It's just so hot. Like, it's very difficult in that sense. So you have a pricing expectation that's very low from the market. And then you've got to try and find somebody who is wanting to work out in the weather, do a physical job, right? Which has a lot of benefits, but the pay from the market and the mm. difficulty of the job don't align. So people just go, why would I earn? Why would I work for $30 an hour when I can go do FIFA work? When I can go get my Bobcat ticket or my M license? or, you know, HR license, whatever it is to do, truck driving. There's plenty of other jobs that I can do. The market is, employee market is so hard to find people. So the biggest challenge, they're the two things that that uh, that I said to start with. But the third one that is, is so underrated is these are not normal employees like you would have in a normal business in that you would, normal business, let's say I'm working for you, 
Joel, we're doing video editing and stuff like that. We're probably in the same room or at least the same building all the time. Mm. It's actually incredibly rare. You think of every job that's out there, how many jobs are out there where you have somebody who is unsupervised if they're out in the road on their own. So you have unsupervised employees who are getting the market is expecting to be paid very low white wages who are doing very difficult physical work that takes attention to detail. You just narrow down. There are so few people who can actually fit that bill. And then there are so few businesses that can afford to pay and compete with mining money or golf course mm. money or all that sort of stuff. And so everyone in the guarding industry is fighting for the top 1% of employees. And it's a very difficult thing to do. So a lot of guys, when they're on the tools and they're out with the team, things run well. Don't kick yourself if you're like that. Because if you're managing a Hungry Jacks, it's exactly the same situation. The manager walks out of the Hungry Jacks, everything falls apart. And a lot of business owners start kicking themselves thinking, oh, what am I doing wrong? It's just difficult. Mm. And that's why so few people, because I had a conversation today with a guy, today sent me a message saying he's paying his $400 a day. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't have permission, but $400 a day. I don't know if that's a subcontractor rate or whatever it is, but he worked out that he needs to charge $210 an hour to make that work mm. because of products and everything else, the equipment, everything else. That he so Anyways, that's, it's such a challenge and, and that's why everyone hits the ceiling because eventually what the bigger you get, the more unsupervised people you get, hmm. the more wages you need to pay and it's just very difficult to sustain that for a long period of time. No, no, thanks for that advice. That's really, really good and I'm sure that resonates with a lot of our guys because I interview a lot of franchisees and the max I always hear is eight to nine and they might have a couple of guys and they, they do it and they run a pretty tight ship but yeah, trying to get to that number beyond that uh, seems to be quite difficult and all the points you laid out are really good and do you think, well, how does the pricing perception around customers then change here? What, what needs to be done? Because um, I presume, you know, high pages and air tasks will all have these price guides, right? If you type in gardening mm. price guide because of the keyword, they want their search term, they make a bloody page on their website and they list the price range and people think, oh, that's what I should pay. And then they get the quote from the, the local guy or from the gyms guy and it's way more and they think we'll get it cheaper. So from a pricing expectation with consumers, do you think it's just something where people still think the stigma around that manual labor, they think it's easy? You know, I can do it. I, it should be worth this. Or do you think, what do you think uh, that is? Or is it the online aggregating stuff who are making, you know, who are putting out price guys like front and center and any Tom, Dick and Harry's put themselves on Airtasker, for example, and charging a really low rate or even in the local Facebook group. So what do you think can be done to maybe to sort of address that? And how should then maybe a, a lot, how should, how do you then, well, have you dealt with then justifying your prices then uh, to customers? Well, there's a few questions there. So justifying prices, you don't justify prices through words. You mm. justify prices through results. So you can go there, you can talk to your black and blue, but ultimately somebody, it's a visual result that someone's looking for. And so the only way to really justify a high price is to have done work that is excellent and to showcase that social media, website, things like that. So if you go on our website, I don't know if you've been on our no, website, I before, Joel, yeah. at all, you've seen yeah. it. There you go. So we've spent a lot of money and a lot of time on our website to make the marketing look like we know what we're doing, right? And then we do know what we're doing. That sends these sort of messages where we're, we're trying to say, yeah, we're really good. And then there's one percenters. And think about it this way. When you're in business, if you're 1% better at every single point of contact, Someone calls up, and I know Jim talks about this as well, right? So this is this is not a new philosophy, but it's so underrated. If you're quicker at answering the phone, you're friendlier when you answer the phone. When you rock up, like underrated tip, put deodorant on, <laughs> like so underrated mm. because I, I, I'm, I'm bad at this. I don't realize how bad I smell sometimes. I don't realize how dust to A little bit of deodorant in the car. Yeah. You know, just to freshen yourself up, a smile on your face, say hello, measure something out. You're there on time. You give them a price. If someone else was a little bit worse answering phone, a little bit, you know, slower, they, they're a bit grumpy when they rocked up, all that kind of stuff. They're a bit late. They stuffed them around, right? You charge 75, they charge 55. The actions were speaking, mm. right? If you were exactly the same as the other guy and then they go, you're 75, they're 55. It doesn't matter what you say. The words are not going to do anything, especially with the actions. You've, you've done everything and then you have some great before and after photos. 
So that's that's the way that I would justify prices. And you'll be surprised, people, you'll be surprised what happens when you don't negotiate and you just have that as a principle. And the thing that we've always said is, is you know, our time, we're a labor business, which means the only way we can reduce price, there's only two ways we can reduce price, is either reduce what we pay our staff or reduce the time we're on site. And we don't want to lower the quality of our staff and we don't want to rush our staff. So if you want lower quality staff and you want a rush job, that's not for us. Mm. But if you want what we offer, again, we're quick to answer. We're doing, you know, uh, the quotes nice and happy, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea photos. So that works. Now, one thing we did, I don't know if we talked about this, um, Joel, for many years when we had all that staff, we would call every single client after their first service and regular clients once a, about once a quarter. And out of 268 calls we made one year, we only had six ratings that were six or less out of 10. Mm. Our most common rating was 10 out of 10. Our next most common was nine. Our next most common was eight. We had from memory about 30 that was seven. But it was more than half of all our ratings were 10 out of 10. And we were charging at that time, this will blow some people's minds. It probably shouldn't, but we were charging about $127 per hour per person. We didn't tell the client that. We mm. would just say, oh, this job will be, say, $127. And they say, yes, no worries. And then we just do it. It just happens to take us an hour. So people, the way we set up the business, just beating everybody on those one percenters getting to the job better, doing it faster, all that sort of stuff. It gives context to where, like I said, let's yeah. say we're 127, somebody else is 90. And they go, ah, it's a lot of money difference, but you know what? They've backed everything up. And then even just calling, you know, just we, we had a lady. Who, it's funny because her name was Karen, which you think <laughs> would be the person who would give yeah. all the complaints. All she was yeah. the person who called up. She was the one who was calling up, asking for all the uh, feedback. But yeah, like even just calling up, people go, wow, they actually care. Yeah. Uh, so things like that are what we did. And um, I think you asked about the, the air task and stuff as well. So well, I groups think is, groups is the other one for us. The groups, like I see like the backyard Barry, no offense to anyone called Barry, but like the backyard Barry says, a lot of the times it happens to us, they actually use our name. They say, don't call Jim's. Jim's quoted $200 for this lawn. I quote $80 mm. and put a picture of the lawn in the group, right? So, mm. well, if your only value that you're giving to the market so let me let me word it differently if the only tool you have at convincing somebody to use you is price mm. it forces you in a competition to go cheaper yeah and so ultimately you can see how if you're in a very competitive market you're going to have to cut yourself cut yourself cut yourself down and that is a recipe for disaster long term mm. right and so essentially uh, this is why I say gyms and independents who do good work are not competing against each other mm. because yes, you might compete against each other on certain jobs, but it's actually the people who don't offer anything more than price to the market mm. that bring down that expectation. Yeah. So if I go quote a gyms, I go quote against a gym guy, right? And they quote, let's say I quote 130 and they quote 125. They're not ripping anybody off. That's we're spot on, right? And if somebody goes with Jim's guy for 125, that means that I need to up my game, right? I don't think that they're, they're not, this, that's not a bad business. If someone comes in and goes 70 bucks mm. and the other two of us are quoting, we've done our numbers, we worked out what we need to charge, it's that $70 guy that's really hurting the industry. They will last six, seven months. They stop rocking up. You've heard yeah. these stories, everyone's heard these stories before. Then they call gyms and they go, hey, my lawnmowing guy, independent guy sucks. He stopped rocking up, right? And then you rock up and you go, oh, that'll be 120 bucks. Go, oh, well, the last guy charged 70. Yeah. Well, why do you think he stopped rocking up? You know, maybe you should uh, consider that, you know? <laughs> no, well, everything you said is spot on. I'm going to take you back. We actually have the, the advice about the deodorant and the stuff's fantastic. We actually have a separate quoting shirt for our guys. So it's not the work oh, shirt. They have, they have a separate quoting shirt and we tell them to put it on. And you're 100% yep. right. It's the... I've used a non-gyms person to do some a service that, believe it or not, gym doesn't do. And the no, I've noticed the difference between the gyms guy and between <laughs> Wait, the non- hold on a second. Let's just stop there. Did yep. you say there's a service that gyms doesn't do? There was a specific service, yes. That's correct. And then um, I actually went through a gyms guy to get this guy um, but because oh, it was a okay. referral. But the guys, the difference was just talk and cheese. And, the, and you're right, it's the communication. Right. Calling yep. within, you know, five minutes, you know, just the rocking up on time, all the basic stuff. And thinking, yeah, that sounds obvious in business. 
but it's not that obvious in business to be consistent and to do that. So how and also the um uh, the stuff you said then which about the pr- the price and we actually have a price rating. So cut people might not know that if someone goes you know too expensive or complain about price doesn't count count as a complaint against our franchisee. And we're quite sometimes sure. people get annoyed with us. We put pricing a lot online actually. We don't have it on our website or anything, but Jim does often talk about you know how much you can make and stuff and people go don't mm-hmm. tell that so people but we and as is we're, we're the same sort of thing we don't want the cheap customer we don't want no. that we don't want the, the bottom of the barrel customer because they're going to be problems and more likely this and that and they're not going to be with your mates likely long term so i think that's that or you or what you just said spot on in regards to what we we sort of preach as well and i think the pricing things for me is an interesting one where there seem to be you know, obviously we're going in this be more philosophical now, but the knowledge work is arrogance, you know, if the lawyer or the accountant thinking that, you know, what they do is so much more valuable than the gardening thing. Now, mm. look, you might you don't have to go to uni to, you know, for seven years or five years to do a double degree to do the lawyer or accountant, but now I can use ChatGPT to whip me out something that's pretty similar to what you do. Whereas they couldn't get out the front and do their hedge or, you know, do a soft landscaping job or whatever. So I think the valuation needs to start shifting between knowledge workers who are who will engage in the local gardener and actually value mm. what they do because I quite I think it's going to be good for gardeners long term because people are going to become way more useless in regards to their hands. If you don't know how to use your hands, you're going to outsource oh, everything, right? So I think yeah, yeah. long term, I think hopefully the attitude towards the pricing shifts because um I think it's definitely helping I, with you guys the independence because that price survey to me was very surprising. It was very surprising to Jim. So check out Luke's episode on the pricing survey. It's really valuable. The 811 responses you had for the, the most recent one, which was yeah. really cool. But that data for us was really valuable because that's similar to what we want our guys to charge. So was to hear that you guys or most of the guys were on part of that, I think it's a really good thing for everyone. Well, I'll, I'll talk about the survey in a second, but there's there's one thing that we're touching on here that is you're talking about, so you rock up and you're talking about the lawyers and the things disrespecting, mm. right? He's... Here is the uh, such a counterintuitive, but this is one of my best tips. Now, honestly, the if anybody gets anything out of this, hopefully this is it. When you rock up, you can sense anyone who's been in this for three, four weeks. You can sense when somebody is not happy with your price, right? You start quoting, you're talking, you can feel it, you can see there's some tension. Sometimes you feel it before you even rock up. You know, like you just look at the property, you know, okay, whatever you feel that there is a pressure to lower your price. Do the opposite. This is my pro tip. Here's why. Let's say, Joel, I quote you and you go, okay, I've got this uh, hedging job. It says hedging. And it's you've got a budget of 150 to 200 bucks. That's what you're thinking in your head. I rock up and I think this is a $200 job. Okay. You might go, oh, sweet. I'm within Joel's budget. Let's say we haven't talked at all. Me and you haven't talked. I'm just quoting. In your head, you might go, that's great. I'm within the guy's budget. Red flag. The last place you want to be is the pinnacle of someone's budget. And here's why. If you've got $200, but your budget was $150 to $200, you really wanted to spend $150, but Mm. you can't be stuffed looking for anyone else. So you feel like in a hostage negotiation, you'll pay the $200, but you will be the most nitpicky person in the world because you are losing every single cent you budgeted for that job. So what some people do because they don't want, they lower their price. They go 170. Okay, it's a bit more comfortable, but here's the problem we just talked about before. You got two options, pay yourself less or spend less time on the job. You start rushing the job, right? And somebody goes, I probably could have done it for 150. All of a sudden, you you miss a couple of leaves somewhere, right? You, let's say you're blowing down and two, three leaves. You know how it is. They get caught in the front door. People who've done any work, they know the wind blows it. Someone comes home, looks at the hedge, oh, all right, they go open their front door, three leaves there. Hmm. Bad review, right? Because you've cost them money that didn't really want to spend. In that scenario, do you know what you do? You think it's 200, you think they're nitpicky, up the price, 220, 250. And what happens is they say no. And you think, oh, I've lost the job. No, what you haven't lost is you haven't lost a job. You've lost a bad review, hmm. right? And you've kept your peace of mind. And you've kept your integrity. And what happens long-term, and I I can promise you this, it's not going to happen in a week. It's not going to happen in a month. But long-term, what's going to happen is you build a confidence in you that those lawyers, those people like that who, or, you know, it's not always lawyers, some great people, you know, in those industries. But the people who look down on you, when you just go, no, we don't negotiate, or or we don't, they go, actually, this guy must be good. Mm. He must, he must be, this, this chick she must know what she's talking about. Two years from now, 
three years from now, you get a call back, same person, right? Maybe their financial situation has changed and they never forgot the moment that the gym's guy did not lower their price because they weren't going to lower their standard. And they go, do you know what? This is what I really want. Mm. Or they tell a friend. And so you get a positive word of mouth, right? Now, what happens if you win the job and they're actually happy? You think, oh, that's a great win. No, it's not because they're going to tell their friends and the friends they have are also tight asses who the story they're going to get is, oh, I called the gym's guy and he said 200, but I haggled him down to 170. So the Mm. friend, the word of mouth you get is somebody who thinks that they can haggle you. So long-term, it's a painful thing to, to do. Short-term, it's painful, but long-term, it's the right thing to do. Mm. And I was going to say, one uh, question I want to ask you before you mentioned it before, which I think was really good, the calling of the customer post-job. That was, um, we obviously have a service which goes nine days later, but I met some franchisees with their crews. They always send a photo to the customer post-job. And if there's anything mm-hmm. you want us to do, we come back. And most of the time, they say, great job. Very rarely, they get them to come back, but sometimes they do, which is a little 1%. But I think that's so important about that cementing that relationship and i think it's such a it's what was it 200 calls in the year you made but that that effort just that little one percent i think would have maybe helped build that regular business far faster than if you didn't do it well it was yeah it was, yeah, it was 268 mm. calls that got through 268 ratings that we had people sometimes ignored the calls and things because it was a completely different number but one of the things about it as well is it helps you it, it's humbling because you're on you're on the hook there, you know, and you're letting somebody criticize you. But the reality is, is they're going to say it anyway. Mm. They're, they're going to tell their friends. They might post it on social media. Very rarely do they do that, but people will say, hey, look, oh, this long going guy or this, this, this horticultural chick I've got, ah, oh, they could this, but they're always doing this and always forgetting this and blah, blah, blah. And you call them up and they go, well, one, they care. And two, I'm open to that feedback. And this is why we had a completely separate lady and the, that was literally her whole job. She was a she had mum with some kids and she did a few hours a week just doing this for us. And the reason is that no, you, you feel comfortable telling somebody who's not the person who did the job. Do you know mm. what I mean? You feel like you can actually tell them what you think. They're not going to get offended. But it could have helped us catch so many little problems that we were going to get told about anyway. Mm. Right? But someone would be like, oh, it was really good. But hey, I don't know if you realize, but there's when yeah because we'd have different people go to this job sometimes be like hey when this chick goes she does a really good job when this guy goes he often misses this spot right that's just oh yeah Yeah. what did you call him barry before (laughs) you say barry's working for us backyard barry hey backyard barry do you realize this client oh that little spot in the corner you know that's actually something you do oh really oh sorry it's just missed fixed problem solved that one percent and then they come back next time Barry was there and he did that corner and they go, oh, wow, this is a business that listens. Yeah. And so the value is immense, you know. I love it because we have a nine-day survey which goes down. Generally, the customer has an issue, they'll wait till the survey and do it. Then the franchise has an opportunity to go and fix it and stuff. But doing that before that, even that process, I think, you know, if it's a text message or a photo or whatever it is, I think it's just so much more invaluable. And as you said, it, it, customer retention would definitely help and would definitely solidify maybe those once-offs into regs, I think would definitely be mm-hmm. um, a, such a really good little tip and but wanting to proactively seek that feedback can be very hard for people as well because it can be a bit of a shot to the oh, self-esteem if you don't get the right feedback for something you think is a good job <laughs> Been there before. yeah and but also if you think you did a good job and they don't think you did a mm. good job it also gives you really good feedback on how you quoted and your communication and whether or not you truly understood what they were wanting when they when they did that does that make sense yeah like you you can try and twist a lot of people will say they're a great business, right? Okay, here's, here's something. If we've got time for this, this thing. Here's a humbling thing. When you're in business and you quote someone, you always hear about the last guy being useless and it gives you a false sense of confidence. Why? Because the only people who are going to call you are people who are either brand new or they're dissatisfied, brand new to the area or they're dissatisfied mm. with the last guy. No one ever calls you when their last guy was amazing, right? Unless he retires right? Or something happens to it. It's incredibly rare. So you keep going to these jobs thinking everybody else is useless. <laughs> there actually might be five, six, seven contractors in your area that are booked out that yeah. are just amazing. Mm-hmm. It could be other gyms guys. It could be, in, you just don't hear about them, right? And maybe they're the nicest guys ever, the nicest girls ever. They're going to help. They're not really, you know, the horrible people that kind of, you know, flip you the bird if you try and ask them a question. But the, the thing is that I, 
this is the trap I fell in early days. I thought I was the bees knees, the ducks nuts the first couple of years in business because all I would hear were all these people telling me somebody else is ripping him off and you're much better value. I was undercharging. So this person is really bad and you know, they were never very flexible and, and you change your schedule. Now I became in, inefficient. I heard all these whinges and stuff, and I thought I was a great business in three years and I'm like, I'm not doing too well. And I realized I had a false sense of security, a mm. false sense of confidence because everybody kept telling me the last guy sucked. But the great guys out there, no one was leaving them, you know? That's, that's a really good uh, point. Thanks for sharing that story as well. But I want to ask you really quickly now about something a bit more philosophical as well, but charging with self-esteem. So I watched your I watched your spreadsheet, which is a really good, helpful spreadsheet. I can see why it's your most downloaded episode. I would suggest our guys and girls watch that because it was really, really important. So, so is that the one that's called how to work out how to what you should be charging? Yeah, you think you had the spreadsheet on there on the background. Yeah. It was the 10,000 views one on um, YouTube. I was watching that before. Yep. And I thought it was just a really good insight. There's some things that I picked up even from watching it, which I know that I don't think we even te- teach in our training. I know in our training we have similar sort of stuff, but it wasn't – there were some things what you did in the way you looked at how you charge in your business and stuff. Which we obviously talk about travel time and stuff like that, but there's some other things in there which I thought was really, really good. But the one thing mm-hmm. I find sometimes with a lot of our guys and girls, some people don't have this problem at all. They think they're worth thousand dollars an hour. Sure. But there's some yeah. some people who come in and they've been in an employment for 30 years, or maybe their mm-hmm. self-esteem or self-confidence is not as high. And they just find it very hard to charge the value of what let that sheet you showed, which was really good, that sort of mm-hmm. rate. They just find it weird. There's a weird feeling they get. So how do you, obviously they're in business and this is, they need to get out of that. But how did you ever that pro- have that problem yourself? And how would you say someone becomes more confident in charging those rates? Because you know we obviously tell you know our guys and girls you know you do quality work you should charge appropriately. But some people just still don't have that belief or that confidence. Maybe because they don't know much more outside that their own market or their business. But what would advice would you give around that sort of area? Well, the first thing is, are you actually worth that rate, right? And a lot of people don't believe they are. And so what I recommend, you know, go watch this episode, but I find that most people need to be charging for time on site about $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. Give or take, depending on the business you run. If you're on the same location all day, it's different. Now you go, "That's, that's so much money. I could never get this. Okay, let me in a minute explain to you why. The average or median, I should say, income in Australia somewhere around $80,000 a year for a full-time job, right? I believe someone who solves problems, runs a small business, uh, is out there in the heat, they deserve median wage at least. I don't. Would you agree with that, Joel? For sure. Right. 80 grand a year works out to $40 an hour. So people go, why would you charge 100 if all I need is 40? Okay, let me break it down real quick. Number one thing, non-billable hours. A lot of people spend about 20%, 25% of their day doing non-billable hours. What's that? Travel time, invoicing, answering phone calls, equipment maintenance, going to Bunnings. You might feel like that's not something that you should charge for. However, if you employ someone legally, you need to pay them for those hours. That means that you are undercutting yourself. You are treating yourself like a slave because that's what the government would call you if you were to mm. do that to an employee. So you need to pay yourself those hours. So straight away, if you spend 25% of your day doing non-billables, your hourly rate goes from 100 to 75. I find that most people, they average about $20 per hour in expenses, give or take. That takes our $75 an hour to $55 an hour. And then we go, well, we got $40 an hour left. Well, here's the thing. Have you heard of superannuation and workers' compensation. Superannuation is what, 10, 11% now? Yeah, 11 is going to keep going compen- up. Yeah, 11 and a half. But, you know, politicians get 15%, which I, I just learned the other day, which is quite funny. Right. We, get, we get 11% yeah. or something, and politicians are 15. So there's one for you. Politicians, you know, everybody <laughs> says though, politicians don't get paid enough. I hear it all the time. So, you know. <laughs> I thought that was so a big got- today, yeah. Oh, mate. Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I try. Oh, uh, listen. I know. Well, if we get into that, it'll probably get cancelled. I mean, Jim's had <laughs> Jim's had enough political opinions come out lately, hasn't he? Very true. Uh, not that I'm against them. Anyway, <laughs> let's. Um, so we've got our fifty five dollars now left. People go, well, I need forty. No, you don't. If you're paying yourself like an employee, eighty thousand dollars a year is forty dollars an hour. But you also get super and workers' compensation as an employee. Super, like we said, about ten. 
So let's call that $4. So you should 44 workers compensation is about 5%. It depends mm. on now it, it's a lot, it's a lot of stuff. Cause it's obviously not workers comp. You're paying yourself. It'd be uh, what's it? Personal, uh, personal, injury injury protection. Protection. personal injury income protection. Yeah. That's sort of that stuff. Sort of stuff. Yeah. Let's call it 5%. So that's another, that's another $2. So you should be paying yourself $46 an hour, right? You got $55 an hour. Then that $9 an hour, right? That's what you call profit. And a business should be profitable. And what that means is if you break your leg, and this is part of the story I, I, we haven't talked about yet. I had a major health crisis at 26 and I went from running an ultra marathon, 100 kilometers in a day on September the 28th, 2019 and November the 11th, 2020. So about 14 months later, I couldn't work anymore. And I had a massive, that happens to everybody. If all you can afford is to pay an employee, if everything goes downhill and you have no profit, no cream on top, you have to sell the business. Mm. You need you are taking on so much risk when you don't consider that sort of stuff. You don't consider super workers compensation. Well, what are you going to do when you break your leg? You've got no compensation. What are you going to do when you retire? You've got no super. And if you have no profit, what's the point? Why not just go get a job on the mines? This is the whole thing people are getting at. Now, there's obviously other benefits. We you talk about them all the time. You know, being out in the sun, you know, being able to control the time that you work, family time, blah, 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 blah. But the financial side is, again, I said it was a minute. We got sidetracked. But you can see how in a minute I could explain exactly why $100 an hour is not an unreasonable amount to charge. That's an awesome, it's an awesome episode. Um, Luke goes through it for an hour. I'm sure people listening, if they know who you are, which they probably will, they've watched it. But if you haven't watched it, it's a really good one. And, you know, the stuff you go through, some other stuff in there as well, which I thought was really, really good. I don't think that stuff we cover at all. So if you are a franchisee, listening to this or a franchise or was recommend that, checking it out. Was that stuff about extorting people? No. Uh, using your chainsaw to chase people down <laughs> and stuff? Is that the part that you don't yeah. do? Yeah. Well, they have to listen to find out. They might, might be in there, so they have to listen. <laughs> maybe hopefully get a few more few more downloads and listen to for that. But it's a really um, – I thought it was so valuable because obviously people want to consume that content because they just don't know. And I think obviously mm-hmm. even them and people come to our system, we, we teach it, but you need to have that – you need to have that re-education almost in a way to keep going over. And I think we always recommend to our guys – get a bookkeeper ASAP. We are like, we have Jim's bookkeeping and we give some franchisors mm-hmm. actually give a package to our guys. They say he's a free bookkeeper for the first six months, which I think is really Great good idea. To, get, to get that set up because a lot of a lot of our businesses, unfortunately, if there's a separation, sometimes a lot of the time the, the partner, I'm not trying to stereotype you, but the partner will do the books most of the time. And if there's a relationship mm-hmm. breakdown, hubby's got no idea, business folds. I've seen that happen a lot. Um, but yeah, get a bookkeeper. I think from 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 our perspective is probably the best thing to do. But I just think just sitting down with that business mind, so that, that, spreadsheet if people saw that and went through with their own business they'd be going jesus and when they put their own numbers in there and i know you can download it from your website too which i think is really cool so i recommend yep. people do that because i think that'd be quite illuminating to some people who are doing sole traders and maybe have their first employee i reckon there'd be some numbers they're missing out which you outlined on there because i because I, yeah. we had mike handy's out from america and he sort of went through yeah. they're a bit different in their mindset with their stuff you know they, they have the real business owner mindset like they don't want to work on the tools they want to get off the tools asap and run their crews and have the p4p P app whereas the australian market you can still make a pretty good way as a sole trader but i think getting that mindset was um will be really invaluable for for anyone so maybe with with, with the charges just real quickly what are some common things that they, they need to watch your episode for one but the the what are some just common things that most people don't take into consideration beyond travel time per se well okay well travel time is the biggest one but, okay, the most common thing people are not taking into account, well, we talked about super workers' compensation, so they're not taking into account that for their future. Um, equipment maintenance. I, I also think just charging for – so I had a conversation with a guy yesterday, and he was telling me about how his machines are, are not getting uh, services frequently as they should. He's falling behind on it. And I told him, like, we book out our service, our, our maintenance like a service. So mowing, you know, you – you book in a client every two weeks or well, book in changing your rotary blades every two weeks book in uh, for us we got cylinder mowers adjusting our cylinder weekly you know quarterly book it in like a job into your calendar things like that now what people feel like is they go oh well, that's stealing money because i can't make money when i'm doing that job and if you get nervous doing that well then you know that you're not charging enough mm. for those in your other jobs to cover that non-billable time and uh, when something goes wrong you know, the most expensive part of owning a piece of equipment is not when you purchase it. It's when it breaks and you can't use it, 
right? If you're doing a thousand dollars a day of mowing and your sixteen hundred hundred dollar Honda HRU two one six has a gearbox problem, the five hundred dollars it costs you to replace it is nothing compared to the three days it's out of action. You've mm-hmm. lost three thousand dollars of work, and that's why yeah, that that's that's another thing. I mean, what else is that? There's there's a quoting. There's yeah, I think profit is is the other thing people just don't account for. Like we said before, like you take on all this risk. You know, people aren't guaranteed to pay you. Do you know what I mean? And there's very little re- legal repercussion. If you were an employee of mine and I didn't pay you, it's so easy for you to take me out. Mm. But if a client doesn't pay me, I'm, I've got almost nothing I can do, right? So things like that, that people aren't taking into account. And, and, and I understand it because it is so difficult to run a business. You've got clients who've got requests. It's hot. It's, it's windy. It's rainy. It's, you're struggling to keep up with demand. And then someone like me comes along and says, oh, you need to spend all this time doing all this other stuff. But ultimately, like I say, if you're not booking that, you can book that stuff into your schedule, make it part of your services. You realize that you're not going to be able to do 20% of the, of the gardening work you want to do. And then you go, mm, I'm going to have to raise my prices 20% to make it work. Over mm. time, all of a sudden, you've got a great business. Now, software stack and time management for your business. How do you how do you operate it? Um, what what sort of software are you using? How you what's the actual operational side of your business look like? So we have work from home admin who take the calls. Um, I haven't answered a call or an email other than you know massive sites you know, like the principles of a private school or something like that. Yeah, you know, I haven't answered a phone call from a client in maybe seven years mm. because I'm useless at that sort of stuff. <laughs> Very forgetful. It's not my strength. So we have work from home admin that answer the phones, deal with all that. And then we have guidance who do the jobs. And we use a software system that forces clock in, clock out times. That means that if someone calls us up, they, they know when someone's, you know, they call up Mark in the office. You know, they know that Elliot's probably an hour away. And, and then we have after photos. And, and every Tuesday morning, I have meetings with the team and we, we go through the after photos. Is there any way we could have improved this? Um, how's this going? And and that's another thing that solves problems. We had a client, uh, their neighbor keeps driving over their sprinkler. <laughs> and so we keep fixing this sprinkler and I go, look, let's just send them a message and say, hey, look, can we, do you want us to put some concrete surrounds around these sprinklers? Uh, you know, obviously right next to the driveway, lose all the pressure, blah, blah. He came back today and he said, can you just do an entire retic overhaul? So one email was $2,000 probably mm. worth, of, worth of work. Yeah. It may be more, you know, so... Uh, that's kind of a, a synopsis of how we run it. I think we we can do better at that. I think that's a lot of my problems in the past have come from I'm very visionary, very driven. Uh, I'm not good at, at at the maintenance side of a business. The operational itself. sort of uh, side, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm into fancy ideas, and you know, sounds uh, like Jim. It's the same. Jim's the ideas visionary exactly. man, and then other people have to do all the work to put them in place. <laughs> exactly. That's why I haven't answered the phone in so long. <laughs> No, that's a good idea. I think, I think every, that's all businesses. All business, the, the founder and the CEO of a business is generally the visionary and the leader. They're not in the nitty gritty doing the operational, making things tick. Generally, that's the way it goes. And, and I think that's you're you're in, you're in pretty you're in fine company there with most successful business owners. I think they're way more visionary, idea based, those type of people yeah. than the operational side of person. And then and then you have a really exciting idea, which is you know someone like me would be like, you know, let's save money on the solar panels. And the batteries, you know, and this is why we're going to do that. And everyone's yes. like, okay, well, he believes it's going to be true. Next minute. It's hard, to argue. it's hard to argue with you people though. It's hard to argue with people who are headstrong visionaries and ideas people. It's very hard to tell them yeah. that their idea or vision won't work. And that's why they're oh, so good because occasionally the idea pulls off and it's a big success. Well, mate, I, I tell you what, I've had that. In, like, we had a, a former employee, great lady. Uh, wish she still worked with us, but, you know, she was with us for a few years and time was up. Yeah, she was the kind of person who she wouldn't tell me exactly what she was seeking mm. and uh, I, I knew she wasn't and so I always had to ask her, okay, what are you, what are you really thinking? You know, what's really going on here? And every now and then she'd really let me know what she was thinking <laughs> and uh, it's not the most enjoyable conversation you've ever had but also stops people from quitting <laughs> you yeah. know, because cause you don't understand how like uh, you know, you're the guy who's been running for ten years, and and you know started with with nothing, and you have an idea, and this is just an employee. But at the same sense, you're an idiot. As in me, I'm an idiot, and uh, I don't know how to answer phones. And uh, about two years ago, I say I say I haven't answered a phone call. I promise you, two three years ago, right? I was in a team meeting, and my admin went to the toilet. 
and her phone rang and I was like, I'll answer this. How hard can it be? And I answered it and I didn't know how to book a job into the software system <laughs> that we had since I started the job that I used to do. And I had to hand write all the notes onto a piece of paper. And I was like, I am, I'm an idiot. I'm useless. <laughs> So, that's why it's, it's, why need, that sh- it's why that show's undercover boss do so well. We put I put Jim in the call center every year and do an undercover gym segment and have him answer a phone call from Beryl or something like that. And yeah, we filmed yeah. it last time. It was quite funny. He was so surprised he was able to book a job. He's like, "Geez, I booked the job!" Like he was real surprised. And, <laughs> and the lady on the and he's telling he told the lady on the phone, "I'm Jim," and she's like, "Oh, all right, that's good." And he's like, "I'm the Jim Jim." And he's like, oh, "Okay," then just got on with it. So it was quite funny. But yeah, we do that every year <laughs> yes. for the same sort of reason. We want to have that sort of hands-on <laughs> approach. But I think. As you said, asking for feedback from staff is 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 a key. And I think um, being able to take that feedback on board is all about improvement. And the best people do that. The best businesses do that. You don't hear of any successful business owner who won't take advice from, doesn't matter who in the organization, they'll just take advice and ideas from everywhere and where they go. But I was going to say as well, how did you how, well, how do you maintain your culture in your in your business with your staff? Because I've had this conversation with a few franchisees and it's been really interesting to hear the differences with them. So I'll give me some examples. A guy called Mitchell's got eight staff. He always sends them out in twos and has a pretty big, mm-hmm. pretty good crew. Another guy called Gerald's really motivational leadership style, like meeting every day. Like he's, you want to work for him after you hear him talk. So how do you, in your business, how do you main, have you maintained that over the years? How do you make sure things are done right? The culture, what are you doing from your perspective? This is actually one of my weaknesses. So it's definitely something I've needed to grow in. I think we do things well, but well isn't good enough. So if you were to see what we were doing compared to, so let's go back to Hungry Jacks, right? I reckon the culture of working here is better than working at Hungry Jacks, but you work in air conditioning at Hungry Jacks. Mm. And so I think you have to be really proactive. You know, like I was pretty, <laughs> I was at this private school yesterday. I'm cutting this private school. I, I do a little bit of work still now on the tools. I really enjoy it. And I rock up. We've had 41 and 43 degrees Saturday, Sunday. Someone's turned my sprinklers off and my beautiful green oval is patchy and dry. And I now, to save the oval, have to do a product application, which takes me hours. And I'm there till 7 p.m. at night, right? Anyways, I'm just in a grumpy mood. I'm not like like raging at anybody, but you know, I'm a little bit more irritable than normal. That sort of stuff happens. And that happens to your employees. And it's really hard... Yeah, buying a couple of power raids, it's nice, you know, on a hot day, but it's still bloody 43 degrees. Mm. And I've really struggled with that in the past. Well, here's what we here's what I've done now. Meetings with the team members where they so this is what I said every Tuesday morning, they know they can tell me what they really think because it's the same it's the same thing with the clients. One of my employees who's been with us uh, the longest, he doesn't like working full fortnights. He loves having every second Friday off. And whilst that's a hit to my profit margin because you know I'm losing 10% of the work he could do, mm. I would be better off restructuring my business around that because that to him makes a big difference. And what it does as well to his fortnight is if something goes wrong, he's never working that 7 p.m. night or he's very rarely working at 7 p.m. night He's never working a Saturday because the worst case scenario is he just works on his day off. He still gets his weekend. He still gets, he can move that around. The value of that to him is immense. Other people don't care about that. Other people, it's not important. They Mm -hmm. wouldn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't bother me, right? Like I'll work all day, work all night. It's, it's not, so, so it's having the conversation with the individuals and I used to think that doing the things like, hey, look, I'd buy masses. There's a fridge over there. I'm in the warehouse right now. Buy cold drinks. Everyone have a cold drink, you know, or just, you know, send an encouraging text message every now and then and think, oh, that's that's good. I'm, I'm better than most bosses. But I, I do think this is another challenge of finding great staff. It's just that I think it is more difficult in our industry. Rain, hot weather, grumpy clients, you know, um, you whip snipped a bit of dog poo and it hit you in the face. <laughs> You know, like that happens and people get grumpy and it just, those things don't happen when you work in a Hungry Jacks, you know? So look, it's, I need to grow in that. But I was going to say, so with your people, like, like I know Mike Andy's when I've talked to him, he does the P for P, which is, he has the app, mm-hmm. P for P, financial incentive to keep his guys motivated. So for you, like if someone comes to work in your business, is it something for the, you, how do you then, do you have like extra certificates you allow them to do or do you take an apprentices to do hot stuff or? 
well, like what's how do you keep what's the like you have like a, a, a goal like do you want an employee when they start to you to be with you for five years or how do you envision it working out and how do you how do you keep well, it we, along? we don't have 13 employees right now we actually downscaled last year so we have the equivalent of maybe four or five yeah i have employees that help me with content as well it gets a bit messy but um really i would say the reason why we shrunk things right down is because we actually wanted to do a similar kind of system to the P4P that Mark Andes is. And I didn't even know who he was mm. um, when I was thinking about that sort of stuff. I've been thinking about that for years. So I guess you could just listen to, listen to that podcast that you've done with him um, to explain it all. That is a problem as well because you have, and this is this is a deep answer, when you have a normal employment situation, works fine with product, works fine with like this Hungry Jacks, let's call it like, you could use an example. The problem with a service-based business is especially one where hot weather changes, you know, you're literally the energy you have to do the job is the client and the business and the employee are all pulling in different directions, mm. right? So the client wants the cheapest price, which means they want it done the fastest possible and they want the lowest hourly rate, right? Fast as possible is the exact opposite of what the employee wants. Lowest hourly rate is the exact opposite of what the business owner wants. What does the business owner want? He wants the fastest possible from his employee, but he wants the highest price. So he's against the employee and against the client. What does the, what does the, the um, employee want? They want the slowest time possible and the largest price. So we're all pulling in different directions. And what you want to do is at least get the employee on side with the business. So there's two of you pulling in the same direction. Client will always want the cheapest price and, you know, you know, more power to them. That's, that's, that's how it should work. That's how I want my things, you know, when I buy them. But ultimately, if you can get them pulling in the same direction, that's essentially what Mark Andes is doing mm. with P4P and uh, several other people like him. So bonus systems could work. I think the problem with the P4P, uh, which I'm, it, I think it's 80%, 90% there, but the issue is that there is an incentive to just go fast. And so the incentive is then to, to if it's just a simple, let's say 50, 50 split. Um, so let's say you charge a hundred bucks, the business gets 50, the employee gets 50. Sounds great. But then, Hey, let's just rush everything because the employee does not get the reputation hit as much as what the business does. So they would just rush, 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 rush. And then you have all those problems. And so we're trying to work through something like that. That's a little bit more uh, sophisticated. It's not the right word, but maybe, maybe it's overcomplicated, but something that might be a little more balanced. No, so, anyway, yeah, no. so what I was, what I was saying is we actually, sh we deliberately shrunk the business down because of some problems we had. And our hand was forced a little bit. People who listen to the podcast know we had a fantastic employee, um, golf course superintendent, 20 years experience in the industry, had a major back injury, mm. had to leave the industry. And that kind of forced us a little bit to make this move, but we were already thinking about it and it was just, go, okay, we're pulling the pin. And uh, we went from nine employees to three employees in a week. Wow. And so anyways, that was, that was not the most fun I've ever had in my life. But um, I think, yeah, long-term, it's like changing gears in a car. You know, or something like that. Like you, you just got to pull the like. You know, if you keep if you keep driving in third, as much as you can rev the engine, you, you're just limited by that gear, and you've got mm -hmm. to change gears at some stage. Yeah, I liken it to um, let's say you're but you're a pioneer in uh, going through the Amazon rainforest. You make a trail, and three mm -hmm. years in, you realize, or you know, ten years in, whatever it is, that the trail's not quite right, and you got to backtrack a couple of years, mm -hmm. make a new trail. Well, if you got to do it, you got to do it. And for being in business for so long, for 10 years, what if someone wants to be in business for 10 years, you mentioned stuff before, obviously, like, you know, rocking up on time, all that sort of stuff, which is the customer service stuff, which you've got to do. But beyond that, how does someone stay in business 10 years? Like, is there something where are you, are you goal driven by money? Is it lifestyle? Like, what do you, how do you motivate yourself to stay in this business? Like, what are you doing constantly to, because to stay in business for 10 years is a long time. And um, is it being something where you making the transition of the tool helps you stay longer or how have you, what, what are your goals in your business and how do you think someone stays in business for as long as you have? What, what are some things beyond, let's say, the, the good customer service and all those other things you've mentioned that keeps someone around? So this would be weird, but I'm not – actually, you know, so me and Jim are similar to this. I'm not motivated by money at all, mm. right? I am perfectly fine, uh, except for when the aircon's broken, <laughs> with my 2009 Triton. You know, I, I've got multiple cars because of the business, right? But honestly, I drive a 2023 Hilux. And I get in the Triton and other than the aircon, I couldn't care less. 
right? One's done 300 and something thousand Ks. The other one's pretty much brand new. Like it's, I'm not motivated by that kind of stuff. What is, I think that's the, the secret to longevity is something beyond that, right? And I think for most people, it's their family. And this is actually why they get out of business. Charging the right amount of money is actually a selfless act. It seems like it's a selfish act. It's only self-centered. But for most people, so some people it is selfish, I should say. So, But for most people I meet in the industry, their motivation is to spend more time with their family. Mm. And you might say, well, charging more money is all about you. But no, charging more money gives you more free time and it makes mm. it all about your kids. I got two kids. I'm going to get old. They're going to get old. And I don't want to miss that kind of season. They're very young at the moment. There's a lot of stuff like that. There's, there's things beyond that. Now, what what is a passion of mine is there's you know, gyms and other franchises might be a good suit for somebody, but a lot of people don't like that risk. And I would mm. love to make a business that can support people financially to the degree that they can earn. My goal is around $100,000 a year for very high-end work, but not breaking their backside and be actually in the industry. And I'm a long way off that, right? But that is, my goal would be if we could get some people around the country and we'll never be the size of the gyms, but I would love to have people who are earning that kind of money. This is what motivates me because what that means is people who love gardening can also not have to work 60 hour weeks, send their kids to a nice school, mm. you know, come home early on a Friday, have every second Friday off, work out something like that so they can balance that. To me, that's where the value is. That's what I really love. And I would prefer, and look, you know, <laughs> this is all words to people who don't know me, but I would prefer to do that and go down that path and not achieve that and fail trying that than to do the easy path, take on a bunch of retirement villages, aged care facilities, mm. schools, whatever, at $80 an hour, pay $25, $30 an hour for some staff, have constant staff turnover, but get 20, 30, 50 employees have the vanity mummers, have some profit. Yeah. At the end of the day, the employees can hardly pay their bills. They're driving up in old, you know, Toyota Camrys where the paint's peeling off and the tires are bald. And um, you're fine with that. That's not something that motivates me at all. Mm. No, that's a really good point. And a lot of our guys probably can relate to that because um, a lot of people might leave, you know, come to gyms for the money reason, but it's the family reason that we find out pretty quickly that they love having mm -hmm. the family time, being able to drop the kid off to school and pick them up and, all that sort of thing is so, so important. I think uh, you just can't put a dollar figure on it. And those who get that perspective right, um, like yourself, really early on, uh, will be better for it. You won't regret spending more, more time for your kids. You know, you won't. But you will regret if you don't spend that time. And I think a lot of people, I know a lot of people are pretty well off and, um, you know, you, you sort of see their lives sometimes and you go, it's wrong priorities. And you know that when they get in that nursing home and you ask them about what are your 10 rules for, you know, people growing up, what they did would definitely not be the way to go. And that's generally the, the case. I, mean, I love, I don't know what people do, but I love seeing the thing like, you know, confessions from people on their deathbed or something like that, or what did you wish yeah. you didn't do? And you always read them. It's always the same stuff. Maybe that's like a 10A. So it's just hidden somewhere else. You've got the 10 points, but it's generally, it's generally family, you know, relationships, less work, it is. those sorts of things, right? And there's, a dollar bit, and there's a dollar figure for happiness. Like it's above 85 grand or something. It doesn't change too much or whatever the figure is. It's not that much. And once you hit that point, adding more money to it's not really the case. Mm. And, I think it's just, yeah, the businesses that you do, independent or a Jim's mowing franchise, Jim's franchise in general, uh, just such a great offering. We had a guy, I'll give you an example, we had a guy came up from Johnny King, Jim's cleaning, he had 70 employees. So we had the vanity metric, as you would say, probably turning over yep. a lot of money. I've got a business with 70 employees. He's paying a hell of a lot to Johnny King. He scouted back, he came into Jim's cleaning, couldn't believe the deal, the flat fee model, and he's, he's a sole trader by himself and he's making the same net profit. I think it's half the net profit now as a sole trader and was he was at Johnny King with 70 employees. And he said his life is just far, far better because he gets to spend time with his yeah. kids. He doesn't have all the problems and all the BS, right? So it's about learning out what you want. Because how old are you? Like you're only 30, early 30s, yeah? I'm 30. I just turned so 30 a month younger. ago. You're a youngin. So you've got well, a war Yeah, I started my quick. business. I started my business at 19 and got married at 21 and basically lost the ability to walk at 26. So I mean, I'm yeah. I'm old in that sense. So I got it back by the way. I can I can do work <laughs> again. But one of the things that you you talked about before which is worth touching on is 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 divorce. Mm. And I think that there's marriage is hard, right? But it's also 
fantastic. In, in, it's both things. So are kids, right? And I think that people underestimate the financial value of not getting divorced. <laughs> Do you yes, know what I mean? For sure. Not that yeah. that's the motivation I have to not get divorced, but it's it's one of those things where if you're money driven and you're not looking at the bigger picture, and I, I find very few people are like this in this industry. Almost no yeah. one comes into gardening just for money. But think about it. I'm I'm not saying there's people on the, uh, the verge of divorce, but there will be people who might have been on the verge of divorce. And then they come into a gyms or independent or whoever is listening to this and that frees up a bit more time. And you just go on one more date night a fortnight because you're not exhausted every single day, although it is pretty physical. But hey, you know, you get used to it. You're not exhausted. You're not working so late. That one date night at the local Hungry Jacks, you know, that might be the difference between success and failure over a 10-year period of time. You know, mm. it's the whoppers that do it ultimately. But you get the idea. Those little things, it's the same thing. We just basically the whole podcast should be the little things that make success in a business. But it's the little things like that that make success with the kids and, and your relationships and all that sort of stuff. And having a successful small business allows that. And what allows you to be successful in that? Charging cash money and not actual cash, but charging the <laughs> right amount of money yeah. and being um, wise with that. And so it's not a selfish motivation to be like, oh, I'm going to charge $100 an hour because I would like a second yacht. Mm. It's I would like to to I would like to be able to afford mm. to take my kids out to maybe an AFL game or something like that once a month, you know, and that's got to cost me an extra 100 bucks and doing something with my wife and going to a fancy restaurant, that's another couple of hundred bucks, especially if she really wants that wine. And I can't afford to charge a hundred bucks an hour and allow yourself to do that sort of stuff. And maybe in 10 years, you look back and go, that might, that was the best relationship decision I ever made in my life. It's a great way to reframe it. And you're right, relationships are so important. Unfortunately, I see the bit is when there's a franchisee and their wife or their partner split and then the business is gone pretty much within mm. a short amount of time. And it's quite, it's quite sad to see actually because... um. It's it's not you know it's a very very hard thing for us to see because we know all, almost all the time if there is a divorce unfortunately the franchise tends to go with it and that's because of the um how tightly connected they are uh, when you come into it because it is truly a family business we say it all the time it is a family business and your partner's got to be on board with it as well and just how how involved is your partner then with your with your wife with your business um she hates it <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. no she doesn't hate it she. When we when we did the restructuring, she came back in to help, and uh, it's difficult with two kids. But it's not her passion. It's something that to hate it is a strong thing. But you have certain people who that's their gifting, and so it's just it's just not in her it's not in her wheelhouse. Even though she she's very smart, she's got a um, double degree or a double major at a university degree. That it's just she just always wanted to be a mum, mm. you know. I'll, t- I'll tell you something else that's really valuable. And maybe this is a bit too personal for some people, but I don't mind. Marriage counseling. When you have a job, <laughs> a real job, like uh, let's just take a step back. How are you going to be good at something if, if you've never really talked to someone who succeeded in it, right? Mm-hmm. The same goes for marriage, right? If you go into something like that blind, I found that it's so easy. Like I, I talk to people all the time who are better than me at stuff. Marriage counseling. I got marriage counseling before I got married, and we've been oh, getting wow. it the whole time, uh, like premarital counseling that it was. Because I just my parents had did not have a successful marriage, and uh, I was like, man, if I'm gonna sign up for this, I'm gonna talk to someone who I look at and go, when I'm you know seventy, I want a marriage like yours. And it's things like that. Like when you work for somebody. Uh, it's very awkward to be like, can I have some personal leave? What, just for an hour and a half. Mm. Why is that? Uh, oh, yeah, you know, and they're like, mm, what are you doing? But when you work for yourself and you're like, hey, you know, love of my life, I would like to invest in this and maybe we can get better at communicating and, and all that sort of stuff. That's maybe there's somebody out there that might be helpful for, and somebody's just gone, how the hell did a mowing podcast get onto marriage <laughs> counseling? But it's things like that, that it frees you up to do playing with a kid. I was just talking about the whole relationship stuff now, really, but that's anyways. great. You know, I think, you know, I, for me personally, Jim, Jim always laughs about, it, but he's been married, you know, he's been divorced three times and you stood opposite to him is what he says. And it's in his book and stuff like that. But um, I think it's really important, but it's great that you have that mindset and that attitude to improve. And I think that, 
taking the ego away from it and getting it help in your week areas is a really thing that people say they want to do and know they do, but it's very hard to then go and do it. And I think um, yeah, being in your own business gives you that flexibility to do those things. And I think it's really, really important. And it's a really good mature way to look at it, Luke. You're a very old person, far, far ahead of a lot of people. I think you know people get to their 50s and 55 and probably gets a lot of learnings what you have done as well. But just for more of the boys as well and the girls, the gear, t- gear talk, what gear do you like in your business and why do you use the gear in particular brands? I've seen you've had a lot of the suppliers on, which we've had at our trade show. Mm. We've done some videos with them. I might get them on actually as well. I think it's a really good idea because you've got Plank, Greenworks, all the different guys. So what are you choosing in your business? So for all the gearheads, we did a series called Makers Month where we had 14 manufacturers of everything from ride-on lawnmowers to handheld whipper snippers to sprayer companies, tow behind sprayer companies, compost computers. Really? So, um, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there's one called Monty Compost, Australian invention. It's a little, it looks like a microphone or a giant golf tee. You <laughs> stick, in, stick in your compost and it tells you what you need to add, all that wow. sort of stuff. So, um, what are we using? So, I've got a walker right here next to me, a, a nice big collection mower, hustler, stand on uh, a lot of cylinder mowers because we're from WA, yep. so a lot of Mowmaster gear, Verdi mowers. We've got some Greenworks stuff, some Ego stuff. <laughs> We've got some AEG stuff coming. I've got AEG drill right here if you are. <laughs> so, look, I, I'm kind of, I'm not a brand snob, <laughs> brand sure. snob. Yeah. Uh, where I'm like, oh, this is the only thing. I think the only brand that I, I truly believe is the best in the world of what they do is MoMaster, specifically yep. for that cylinder mower. Cinema, yep. Now, people will buy MEY and go, well, that's just as good. But MEY is literally a bolt-for-bolt bolt copy of the MoMaster. But look, other than that, I'm happy to try just about anything out. And um, yeah, when those brands came on, I didn't ask them for anything. I didn't charge anything. Uh, I just wanted to hear what they have to say and yeah anyway so i mean with yeah it's it's battery petrol because that's obviously whenever i want to get views oh, in the yes. video, i always put battery versus petrol and i get a heap of comments so for us battery petrol because we, we i'm noticing like i have a lot of franchises the way there's a massive variety in our guys very rare mm-hmm. someone uses the full battery range i know some do but if mm-hmm. you always got the, you got the hybrid setup which seems to be the game and even there's yeah you got the rusted on guys who just refuse to use it but even some of the rusted on guys are slowly adding one, mm-hmm. maybe two pieces to their arsenal. So where do you sit in the whole debate and what are your thoughts on it? Ah, okay. Everyone who uses petrol is retarded. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> that's not what I think at all. Yeah. Uh, no, I think the honest measured response. I get, uh, this is this is who I am, people. So I just a bit silly sometimes. But the honest measured response is handheld stuff, I would say 80% is battery. I, I don't know why anyone would buy, for example, and I'm I'm being serious now. Ninety nine percent of people I, I should not buy a battery, uh, sorry, a petrol hedge trimmer, either extendable, whatever. Right? The only people who should are people who are are doing very, very, in my opinion, very, very tall hedges with very long run times, and they need yep. many extendable poles, or people who don't do a lot of hedging and they've already got say a a steel combi unit and they just chuck the attachment on right like something like that Mm. everybody else i've talked to so many hedge experts like craig ratcliffe or the other craig from hedgehog or or nick from frame it these are these are people nathan from sharps hedges these are people with 50 100 thousand instagram followers the, the most beautiful hedges you've ever seen in your life all battery stuff chainsaws Again, 90-something percent should be battery for a gardener, not for a tree lopper. Tree loppers are different. But if you're just doing general gardening work, we all know you leave a chainsaw for a while. You don't use it for a couple of months. It's hard to start. It doesn't, mm. you know. Yeah, anyways, battery, you just chuck a battery and it goes. And they are so fast. I used the Ego one recently, crazy. Uh, we have a, uh, back to hedge trimmers, we have a, a Greenworks telescopic hedge trimmer. And I feel like an idiot that I didn't buy that earlier because... It, Anyway, if you're doing a lot of tall hedges, that's very handy. Blowers, backpack, steel petrol, handheld battery. I One of my employees is still using a BG56, and I've been using a battery one, and I used his petrol one the other day, and I just thought this is this is like weak cordial. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think other than that, I think... So we've got a Greenworks petrol... Sorry, not petrol... I mean, if we've just got a Greenworks petrol or anything, and we've, we've gone to an alternate universe, but we, we've yeah. got a Greenworks battery mower. They're 21-inch. I would say 
I would say it's about 80% there compared to a Honda HRU216, which I think has been the industry standard for mm. many, many years. I know not everybody loves them. They're not perfect for every situation, but they're a great all-rounder. Greenworks, much lighter, but it's still built like a tank. It's still pretty heavy, um, yeah, because we had one in the office and I'm, it's still got a bit of weight about it, the, um, that one. Right, but yeah. I like that because um, it's kind of that middle ground where some of the battery models are so light, fantastic, you've got to go up mm. a lot of steps or fit through awkward places. That They're the best option for sure. But it's heavy enough that it can get abuse from employees because a lot of the other ones, like the Ego, Ego is coming out with a with a commercial, true commercial one now, but a lot of the stuff is actually residential that's been used in a commercial setting. So, I mean, that's good. The problem is it doesn't cut very low very well. A lot of these American, European design ones don't. Mm. I'm actually getting the AEG one. I haven't got it yet, but that cuts to, I think, 18 mil. We'll see how that goes. But I reckon... There's some people, I reckon 30% of the market that mower is suitable for. And I reckon 70% when they're doing the big overgrown stuff, um, it's not that it can't cut it. It's that the batteries die so quickly when you're doing the overgrown stuff. But we can, we can get a whole day of cutting out of two 8 amp hours um, mm. with that thing. So it's just, they're kind of not there. And then I've never used a battery right on. I just think at the moment, unless you're doing a lot of council work where they care about emissions next to houses, uh, retirement villages where they want quiet noise, uh, they're very expensive. Yeah, they are. So, the only one I've seen is the green, the green machine one from the states. Um, I've seen a few councils over here using that, which is a nice. Are you sure it's yet. green machine or is it green works? Because no, it's green machine. Various. Yeah, oh, no, it's called green machine. Yeah, it's the USA one. So I think it's the world's first one. Yeah, yeah. And I've got, well, it has a proper green, eight, yeah. Greenworks have got one and they, they're somewhat popular over here, but it's all council work. And I think it's yeah. the emission standards and then also like mowing parks next to people's houses. I think they're just trying to go for quiet. So I actually think they're great there. Mm. Um, the Crest stuff I'm interested in, I had them on the podcast. Um, I've never used anything, but that $11,000 battery, a that lot of people- charge thing, the eight minute charge thing. Yeah. Yeah. They've got a battery that basically can charge a whole crew for an entire day. And mm. people think- that's oh why would you ever need that but when you have a team of employees i had a time where an employee put they had two two stroke containers and they filled one up double with oil and the other they didn't put oil in they forgot which one they put the oil in right <laughs> they couldn't see and it destroyed thousands of dollars worth of worth we've had that happen a few with the insurance claims that the person puts the oil on the right on and the right on is stuck oh uh, so. yeah so when you have employees who don't are not as careful with their equipment and just so battery, everybody who's got employees, think about battery from that sense because of the maintenance mm. side of it. You may be getting a reduction in performance in some things. I think like a whippersnipper is a great example that you can get amazing power. I've got a steel battery whippersnipper. I'm intending to get the new Ego one at some stage. But you can get incredible power. Runtime's just so low. And people go, I've got to buy so many batteries. They're so expensive. But you know what? Someday someone's going to do something stupid like that. And you wish you had bought the batteries. And so that's why the cyber charging system interests me. Never used it. Never tried it. Um, but I do feel like there's, if you've got a big crew and you're going out doing a lot of commercial work, people are not going to charge 11 batteries on a wall that you have at your warehouse or something <laughs> like that. They're going to forget, right? Yeah. And then they're going to rock up to a job and the batteries aren't going to be charged. And you're going to go, do you know what? I could have financed that massive $11,000 battery and it would have cost me the same per month as my fuel bill. And all of a sudden it looks attractive if you've got those employees. Well, Crest came to our trade show last year and they, they showed that eight, eight minute cyber charge thing out there as a massive unit. And yeah, it's interesting. I, hope, I haven't seen much of a push beyond that, but I might not be looking in the right spots. But um, yeah, the gear looks pretty impressive in them. Obviously, quite big overseas, so we'll see how that goes in the Australian market. But um, yeah, you're right. It, how you look at it at, from a cost point of view and from a reliability point of view, and I've been after a few guys recently who just use full petrol as well, and the diff I noticed the difference big time because I got some guys who use a battery and some guys who use full petrol, and the difference is quite astounding. And what about customers now? Do you think it comes into do you think you can win more clients using battery power just from a green point of view or from a noise point of view? Or you think it doesn't matter as long as the job's done right? Uh, in our experience, ninety percent of our clients aren't even home. Okay. They're at work. So a lot of them won't care, but I would definitely say at a retirement village, 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, MoMaster have just released a battery cylinder mower. With cylinder mowers, for those who are not aware, they cut through 
the blades touching like sil- like scissors. So blade speed is not important. So run time is similar to hedges and that you can actually get, I can't remember exactly how much, but I believe I was told about 1,200 square meters of mowing off a single battery. Oh, wow. Is, That's a lot. Like a, uh, if I'm, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a lot more than you would get from a rotary mower. And I was like, oh, that's really tempting because two batteries and, and you could mow a, a massive amount of space and it's not exorbitant to buy those batteries. I know some stuff behind the scenes which I can't talk about, which um, they're, they're trying to develop some new stuff there too, which is exciting. So watch that space. I reckon in a year's time, they might have some really good options with the battery stuff there. So look, uh, there's scenarios like that, but I would say the reason I'd be going battery is not, I, I think it's a bit of a twist. I know some people will say, oh, it's, it's very green and all that sort of stuff. It kind of is, but it's also, at the end of the day, your number one job is to do a really good job of the finished product. And that's why I'm going, I would say head trimmers, definitely batteries, blowers, definitely mm. batteries. They're doing a better job on that sort of stuff. And the rest of it, you know, um, you know chainsaws, definitely batteries. I think another thing that's really under, underrated, uh, just on a side note, is... Um, like a handheld reciprocating saw. I know this is a drill that I've got in the video. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. But a handheld reciprocating saw, people grab one of those. And the reason is that you can do that with all your dirty work and just replace the blades. Cutting roots done. Right. Um, you've got a little limb you just want to get out, and you know you've got this done. Cut that. You know, just there's so many little things you can use that for. Things like that people don't realize. If you don't use a chainsaw much, maybe like twice a year get a reciprocating saw and and just go put a really long blade on it. And I'm not talking about cutting down a tree with it, but you're doing it for like Yeah, like roots in the ground and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stuff the size of your arm, you're cutting yeah. a couple of, of limbs off a lemon tree or something like that, man, reciprocating saws like that. Like things like that, people just don't think about that kind of stuff because it's not typically a gardening tool. But there's, yeah, creative things, solutions like that, I think are, um, yeah, they're novel. They're good. Battery sprayers are fantastic. So look, it, it's, yeah. I mean, like I said, at the beginning, you have the controversial view, but the real, when you get into it, it's not quite black and white yet. Because, yeah, we we have the DeVault, DeVault ones that work with the, the saw and they work pretty well. But it's quite it's quite amazing the amount of people are getting into it. There's obviously Makita now. There's DeVault's got a whole range. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of brands that are going really hard and more in the domestic uh, as, as, you know, space. But mm. you know, commercially, you're starting to see a couple of items which are quite quite relevant and as you said it's not too far off you know how, how realistically how far do you think is it purely just the runtime thing maybe the power for the mower just that needs to just get there is it just the battery point because obviously palenque you've had on you've had luke on from palenque and yep. now a lot of our guys use palenque it's just an expensive cost at the start but a lot mm-hmm. of the guys who live, especially the inner city guys love it just because of the um just because of the, the you know they can get one charge all day backpack and they're doing the sole traded small small properties all right well I've had Pelank, Greenworks, Ego, Cress, AG, Husqvarna, uh, Massport, Bush Ranger, Gravely, Protea. That's a. I, I'm gonna. I'm missing somebody here. Someone's gonna get offended. <laughs> I should go to my videos on YouTube to see. So basically, the idea is I've interviewed just about as many people as I possibly can on these podcasts. Skag, there you go. I've gone yeah, Skag's through. good. Yeah. Toro, how did I forget them? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So look, all those brands, I think there is a limit to battery if you're going to get into it as it is right now. And the problem is, here's, here's my stake in the ground. I think what Gravely is doing with the removable batteries from the ride-on mower is the smartest move. There's actually some stuff coming out. A lot of people get excited about battery cars, but if the battery quality is not there, Mm. These batteries are not easily removable and you end up getting incredible depreciation. It's just coming out now. You get incredible depreciation on these tools. So on these cars, sorry. You don't get that with battery handheld tools because you can just replace the battery. And I think that those handheld tools are no brainers, right? Completely different ball game than like Toro's talking about $70,000 for a mower that you can get <laughs> petrol for about high 20s. Right. If I'm remembering correctly, I might be getting it wrong. Now they do all the stats and they say, well, if you run this battery for this long, you know, you're not paying this on fuel and mm. you're going to save money. And I don't think that they're manipulating the data. I think that's honest and that's true. However, my experience is that the gyms guys we're talking to, 
like so what I'm getting at councils, go for it. If all you do is ride on lawn mowing, go for it. But if you're doing I see a lot of guys that get a stand on mower that sell sell after three hundred hours. You never made your money back on that. And the depreciation, I think, is a problem because people are going to go, oh, 300 hours, but has the house battery been treated? Is it going to really last? All that sort of stuff. So I'm nervous about that kind of stuff. And if you're just looking at a greater philosophy, at the end of the day, it is a reduction on emissions, but it's actually not as big as what people think because that's still coming from coal. And unless we get more renewable energy, nuclear, or you know, we just somehow manage uh, to, to make solar panels and all that sort of stuff work immediately it, it's very difficult to make that anyway there's there's just problems with that so i actually um whilst all the greenies and i consider myself uh to a certain degree environmentalist just because i love lawns and gardens and outdoors and stuff i just don't think i just don't think battery is going to be i don't know if it's going to get there with yeah, unless there's a big the technical yeah unless there's a big technical exactly te- yeah, invention or something then because I presume there'd be that many people working on a battery, which is, you know, some battery solution because it just seems to be the biggest problem for everything, you know, the materials and obviously how they get it's not ethical, all these sorts of things as well. But um, big transition phase is just a matter of how long it is. But it's exciting stuff. And I think what you said before, the hybrid setup, I think it's a no-brainer. I, I agree with you. I, I think you're silly to use a hedge trim, which is petrol, unless you, you've got those jobs, as you said. I think there's no excuse. I think you're getting that. Battery powered gear, yeah. there's so much good stuff out there. It's so light as well, like the wrist as well. If you're doing it, I want to be longevity wise as well. Yeah. That weight well, if you've got well. small week, if you've got small week video editing arms like you, you'll have a problem. <laughs> I don't edit videos, mate. I'm not that I'm not that technical. But so they're, not, they're not even got the video editing nah, straight. <laughs> nah, nah. I don't do that, mate. But um, but uh, uh, I was, but I was gonna say, Luke, we've kept you for an hour and a half. Thank you very much for your time as well. I'm gonna put all the links in there. I'm sure the boys and the girls who listen to you will know and hopefully get a lot out of it as well. And, you got a great podcast. It's all the videos, and there's a lot of really good specific information to help them um, on your yeah, channel, just, on your podcast. I will just say there's a guy who – look, I, most of my podcasts are good, but there's this guy who came on recently. I, I just don't watch it, right? It's not, the guy named Joel Kleber, <laughs> and that one I'm actually embarrassed by. So please don't watch <laughs> that episode. <laughs> No, no. Uh, well, thanks for having me on, man. I was, I was, as I said, I, was, I put on my social media. I said I'm the first non-mower – don't own a mower guy to be on the Australian well, I, garden podcast, which is cool. Well, you you say you don't, so you don't have, so you've never used a mower. Is that what you're saying? I've used it. Uh, there's a video when I did a day on the road with the franchisee and I wrecked the lawn with the thing. I'm like, never again. Can't afford it in Melbourne. House prices are too much. If you get grass in the backyard, you're doing all right. So <laughs> if you get it, if they you, got room. They got room for it these days, you know. You can fit your cat just out the backside of uh, back yeah. some of these properties, you know. Uh, artificial turf, mate, and it's probably as much as I will go the old Estro turf. But yeah, no, no. Uh, thanks, for ha- thanks for your time, Luke. And your and our franchisees obviously listen to your podcast and franchisors, and we'll get a kick out of hopefully having you on. And you're the first non gyms person on our podcast, so it's been great uh, to have you on. And you provided a lot of really good information. I think it's a great. You know, you're only 30 years old, so it's a good inspiration to maybe some guys who might be a bit older, maybe getting into it for the first time to hear about your journey and some really good advice. And it's quite interesting how you, you've never probably seen our training, but the stuff you were saying was very similar uh, to obviously what Jim says and to what our franchisees will know from our training experience as well. It was quite, it was quite scary, actually, what you said compared you to go. what we teach. And it's you would never have seen it. So it's... um. Yeah, it's no, a big, I haven't. Big, I've never credit, seen it. Big credit to you. And it's great to hear how the success formula works in your business and ours. It's very similar. So well done to yourself for doing that. And being 30 years old is extremely young to have all the perspective that you do. <laughs> and you do a great you job. You keep bringing that up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, very, mate, I'm 35, man. I'm, I'm, I'm an employee. So I've, I've got no life experience. But you, you've do, been doing what you're doing, which is fantastic. And I'm sure all the boys and the girls listening to your podcast love what you're doing. It's a big credit to you to give back to the community i'm sure you get a lot out of it as well but um, i know you give a lot of value with the guys and as i said i've watched it those interviews um with your pricing and stuff invaluable content you're giving away for nothing and you make that all available to them so hopefully they check that out yeah well they think it's for nothing but i've been spending sending russian spy bots in their phones. <laughs> so yeah it's all manipulated tactics we'll probably cost you money doing this podcast obviously you your thumbnail people you got your people to do the edits in the short form so yeah i don't make much money off it now but yeah, look, in the long Spotify term, deal, mate. Spotify's chucking money. I know exactly. they, need a, they need a lawn and garden yeah. podcast. Joe Rogan's getting 250 mil, chucking 25. I'll shave, I'll shave my head and see how we go. <laughs> that, that might be the difference, all right? Go, go to the gym, <laughs> right. do some ice baths in the morning before your job and see how you go. 
That's it. And then we'll get a sponsorship with Athletic Greens or something like that. And uh, <laughs> we'll be laughing. 100%. <laughs> Better health Athletic Greens. Exactly. I appreciate your time. Look, thank you very much for joining us today on the Jim's Buying Podcast. No worries, mate. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the episode of the More Than Just Mowing podcast by James Mowing. If you do need help with your local gardening expert, please give us a call at 131 546 for Australia, 0800 454 654 for New Zealand, or head to jimsmowing.com.au or jimsmowing.co.nz. If you liked what you heard, please make sure you leave us a review as well, wherever you consume your podcast. We appreciate your support. And until next episode, we hope you have a great week.